Amateur this conference will now be recorded. <laughs> was not expecting that. <laughs> I am now. <laughs> Let me try that again. This is the October 22nd hearing for City of La Center, specifically the Brazil Creek Trail subdivision. My name is Joe Turner. I'm the city's hearing examiner. I'll start with some brief announcements and a summary of the process that will follow so everyone understands how you can participate in the hearing tonight. I start by saying I'm not a, a city employee. I am licensed as an attorney and trained as a planner. I say that so you know you're getting a somewhat independent review of the application before me tonight. My role as the hearings examiner is to conduct public hearings and make decisions about certain land use matters in the city of La Center. In making those decisions, I'm required to apply the city's existing laws. I'm not a policymaker. I don't have the authority to vary from or change the laws. If you think that the laws need to be changed, you can work with city council and planning commission to do that. But state law requires that this application be judged based on the laws in effect when the application was filed. As a hearings examiner, I'm to provide an unbiased decision maker I believe I am unbiased with regard to this application. I have not had any pre-hearing context with contact with any of the parties regarding the substance of the application. And I don't have any interest in the subject property or any of the surrounding properties. But anyone has the right to challenge my impartiality, to argue that I'm biased in one way or another. And you can do that when it's your opportunity to testify. Procedure will follow. I will start by asking staff to summarize their staff report, copies of which are available on the city's website. And the applicant will have the opportunity to present their proposal and respond to the staff report. Then anybody else who wants to testify in support of the application may do so. Then anybody who wants to testify in opposition or with questions or concerns. That should cover everybody who wants to say something about this application. You'll fall into one of those categories. Once everyone has had an initial opportunity to testify, I will give staff and the applicant alone the opportunity to respond to this testimony that was offered. If those responses include any new evidence, I will give everyone a chance to respond to the new evidence. Otherwise, I'll close the public portion of the hearing and announce what I'm going to do. Um, it is important that all parties make their best case to me. Although my decisions are subject to appeal to the city council, the city council may not allow new testimony and evidence on appeal. They'll decide any appeal based on the record before me. So if you feel it's important that myself or any future decision maker know something about this application, you need to make sure it gets into the record before me. In order to preserve your right to appeal, you or someone expressly representing you must testify orally or in writing before the close of the record. And in order to raise an issue on appeal, someone must have raised that issue before me with enough specificity that people can understand what the issue is. If anyone feels they need more time to prepare, you can ask me to hold the record open or continue the hearing. If I hold the record open, you'll have an opportunity to submit additional written testimony and evidence before I make a decision. If I continue the hearing, we can come back and do this again at a later date. But if anybody wants me to hold the record open, or continue the hearing. You must make that request before the close of the hearing today and provide some support for why whatever you want to submit during the open record or continuous period, why that information couldn't be submitted at the hearing tonight. When you testify, please come on up to the podium there. We need to make sure you're on a microphone. Our hearings are recorded as part of our record in the event of an appeal. Please begin your testimony by stating your name and your full mailing address. Please spell your last name so I get it right. And if you represent someone else, please say so. There's no arbitrary limit to the length of time you can testify. The testimony should be relevant to the applicable approval criteria, which are set out in the staff report. Also, please don't repeat testimony offered by yourself or earlier witnesses. Um, this isn't a popularity contest, so repeating your testimony doesn't make your case any stronger. Whether everybody loves it, or everybody hates it is not an issue I get to consider. The only issue I get to consider is whether the application does or does not comply with the applic applicable approval criteria. 
fine. If anyone has any exhibits you want me to consider, such as a copy of your testimony, photographs, other documents, or physical evidence, you can hand it to me. I'll mark it as an exhibit. I'll consider it as part of my deliberations. Is there anyone appearing online? No. Okay. So that concludes my introduction. Who's Ms. Merrill, are you doing the staff report today? Yeah. Okay. Good evening. My name is Angie Merrill, and I'm the associate planner for the city of La Center. And um, tonight we have Preezy, <laughs> Preezy, Preezy Creek Trail subdivision. Um, it's a proposal for 4.87 acres. The current zoning is low density residential with an urban holding overlay of UH10. The comprehensive plan is urban low and parks open space and the proposal is fit for 15 single family residential lots. The pre-application conference for the project was held on August 28th, 2023. The application was submitted on April 26, 2024. The application was deemed technically complete on August 8th, 2024. The notice of application and SEPA MDNS was issued on August 22nd, 2024. The final SEPA MDNS and staff report was issued on October 7th, 2024. And um, the public hearing notice was um, issued and the, posted and published in the Columbian on October 7th, 2024. And then the hearing is tonight, October 22nd. Here is the, I'm showing you the existing conditions of the site. Um, to the north, we have um, Private Ivy Avenue, and then um, the next slide will show you um, second, coming down into the cul-de-sac here, and the 15 lots. Um, also, I'm sorry, I didn't, I wanna go back here. Here is a vicinity map showing the location of the property. And the property um, is showing that it's a budding um, Clark County property. And um, to the west is um, Clark County legacy lands. Uh, again, um, the proposal is for 15 lots, and all lots are going to be between 6,025 square feet and 9,897 square feet. The development um, is requesting to use the density transfer provision on lots 2, 3, and 10, and um, lots 14 and 15 are proposed flag lots. Uh, tracks A through F are currently, um, the proposal is for six separate tracks containing a one stormwater facility located on all six tracks. And staff is recommending that that one stormwater um, facility, facility to be located on one track. Um, tracks G and H are open space. And again, track H is located within Clark County's jurisdiction. Um, the density transfer, the minimum density of the LDR 7.5 zone is four units per net acre. The proposed site contains 1.54 acres of critical areas. There are a total of 15 lots proposed, allowing for no more than three lots below 7,500 square feet. And lots two, three, and 10 are proposed to be less than 7,500 square feet. The applicant has requested a variance in the lot widths for lots seven through nine. And um, then other uh, key issues are critical areas, uh, category two, critical aquifer recharge areas, wetlands, fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas, and priority white oaks and geologically hazardous areas. Um, the variance for lots seven through nine, the minimum lot width required is 60 feet, and um, the applicant is requesting a lot width of 58 feet. The applicant has applied for a variance and for the reduction in the lot widths for the proposed lots, and staff finds that the variance meets the applicable approval criteria according to LCMC 18260040, one through six. 
Um, the applicant provided a critical areas report by a professional, and the applicant provided a revised critical um, areas report and a mitigation plan. There is one Oregon white oak on the property. The Oregon white oak will be preserved with no impacts to the proposal. Um, there are mapped slopes on the site and the applicant is conditioned to adhere to all recommendations contained in the submitted geotechnical report in accordance with LCMC 18300-0904-F. Condition, um, I, there's a couple corrections that I'd like to make. Um, conditions nine and 10 of the staff report were duplicated. And so if you could please strike one of those, that would be great. Um, and then on page 13 of the staff report, um, I referenced um, code 18.160 for urban holding. And that was incorrect. I should have referenced 18.190. That's the correct code for urban holding. And um, that is all I have for the land use portion. Okay. Mr. Cooper. Hi, my name is Tony Cooper. I'm the city engineer for La Center. And I'm going to talk really, you can't really see that very well, but I'll talk about it. Uh, <laughs> transportation, it's okay. I, um, so the, the applicant submitted a tra uh, traffic report by a licensed uh, traffic engineer. And um, they looked at the, the uh, Number of trips that are generated by uh, by the by the number of lots, and what they came up with is there will be 141 uh, daily trips, 11 a.m. a.m. peak hour trips, and 14 p.m. peak hour trips. Um, now, the applicant used what's called the Trip Generation Manual, and this is a nationally recognized manual that uh, is used by across the country that uh, when they when they look at uh, the number of trips generated by all sorts of all sorts of developments and single family is one of them so the applicant used this manual and uh, staff checked it and it is it is um, we do agree with the uh, the applicants um, number of trips and am am and pkm now i will i will say that this is this is a um, you know, the, these numbers are, are averages, what you might see. It doesn't mean you're going to see that many trips all the time. It's just this is the way, and it's, a, and it's a recognized way to determine the amount of trips that you have for a, for a project. So that's the first thing. The traffic report also looked at um, a line of, the line of sight at John Storm Road and Lockwood Creek Road and found that it meets the line of sight requirements for at, uh, at that intersection. So there's no line of sight problems. Um, the next thing is Ivy Avenue, the access. Um, so access will be from East Second Way uh, through Holly Park Subdivision and continue on, on to this new development through, through uh, what's called the local access standard, which is a, which is a city standard for local access, um, which is a 32 foot paved uh, curb to curb and 50 foot right of way. That's what's existing in Holly Park subdivision right now. So what they're doing is just carrying on the same right of way width and um, uh, street section. Um, there is also what's called Ivy Avenue, which is which is just north of there. Um, it is accessed by Fourth um, Street and it continues on south all the way down to the subdivision. However, um, Ivy Avenue is a private road. It is the property is owned by the school district. And so the city has what's called the right of way access and utility easement on Ivy Avenue up to about where the public works shop is. Right there, that access easement ends. South of there, it's private and it's owned by the school district. Now, I know there's access easements for property owners south of there, but that's a private road. Uh, I'd also like to add that um, that road is really not designed for any kind of traffic other than access by by the uh, uh, by the property owners. Um, it is uh, a gravel road at best, and it has a culvert underneath it that is really um, 
very small, and really that road shouldn't be used for anything else other than the, the private access. So I know the applicant is proposing to put a gate on the north side of um, East Second Way to prevent traffic from going down that road. Um, and I would suggest that the applicant needs to do that during construction so the construction vehicles won't use that access point. That's just not really, it's not designed for that. So I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention that that it really is a private road. Um, the next, next slide is, I already talked about the applicant is going to be required to um, improve the subdivision with what's called local street access, ST15. It's the same street section as this carry through East, the, through Holly Park. Um, the the uh, subdivision, this local access design is designed by, uh, with recommendations by the geotechnical engineer. They look at the soil conditions and those roads follow the city standards, but the recommendations by the geotechnical engineer as far as the, the, the actual subgrade. So those, the, the roads are designed, I guess what I'm trying to say is the roads are designed for normal traffic, including emergency vehicles, including, including construction vehicles. They are, um, they are designed to withstand normal traffic loads and construction vehicles. So access to the site for con through construction will be, have to go through a Holly Park subdivision uh, for, them, for, for them to build a subdivision. Um, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is, is um, stormwater um, and erosion control. So the city has an ordinance, uh, erosion control ordinance, and so any, any um, sites that disturbs more than 500 square feet has to comply with the city's erosion control standards. And that being said, it, we have standards that require that the applicant protect the site from silt from getting off um, construction entrances to try to keep the, the site contained with with their their construction and so really there's a lot of there's a lot of things that goes into that into that and so they have to submit a great erosion control plan during an engineering review that will show how they're going to do that the next thing is that um, over one acre of disturbance the applicant is required to get what's called the uh, um, Department of Ecology construction stormwater permit so that's regulated by the Department of Ecology and they have to obtain that and uh, the Department of Ecology, Ecology regulates the amount of um, off-site flow that comes from that to make sure that they stay within standards of, of roach control and um, silt. So they look at that. So um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is that uh, when a, a site has more than 2,000 square feet of pervious surface, they have to comply with the, with the city's stormwater ordinance. And so that's the slide right here shows that um, the applicant is proposing to collect stormwater along the streets in, in catch basins and then it's going to pi be piped to the uh, south uh, south corner of that stormwater pond. That's called a wet pond and it is designed to um, to act as a, as a water quality and detention structure. So it, it Basically, it uh, has two cells, and the, and the first cell allows silt to settle out, and the second, second cell allows water to, to carry over and then outlet through the outlet pipes out to the existing uh, slope to the south, um, southwest there, or northwest, sorry. And, uh, and then so the applicant will need to design a roach control and, as well as that, um, a uh, dispersion trench that will allow the flow to continue on in a, in a sheet flow manner to try to not to disturb the existing um, existing uh, property that's northwest of there. The next slide is for shows a landscape plan. So what I was trying to show here is uh, there's there's trees that are going to be removed, but along the public roads, uh, the applicant's going to be required to comply with the um, uh, planting trees at, at certain spacing. Usually it's, it's around 30, 30 feet spacing. And so the applicant will replace a lot of the vegetation with, with trees along, along that new street. Um, and, and I also like to point out so that the access, you can see the access there coming from the East Second Way, that's the access to the site. 
and then and then the applicant proposes to put this this gate on the north side to allow just um, uh, access by the pro private property owners to the south. And then the next slide. Okay, this next thing is the sewer sewer system. So, Holly Park subdivision. Um, there's 23 lots that um, are served by a by a two inch force main, and that's really because the the Holly Park subdivision when it was designed, part of it is to the to the um, uh, west is lower than the adjacent part of the subdivision. So they couldn't gravity flow all the way to the gravity system. So there's 23 lots in Holly Park subdivision that are connected to this two inch force main. Um, the, the property for this Breezy Creek subdivision is also lower than the gravity system that they can connect to. So they're gonna need to connect to this two inch force main um, and uh, extend, extend that down to the subdivisions with with their grinder pumps from the houses. The applicant submitted a report, a sewer report, to look at the capacity of the existing system with these new lots. And they also looked at the, um, the pump station that's uh, by John Storm Road and uh, that, that uh, connects to this, connects this, this uh, horse main. So they did, they did look at that and it, it uh, verified that it has capacity in that two inch horse main for these new 15 lots. So I think the last thing is, I think the general conditions, I just had a summary of conditions. The condition is the applicant will connect, will need to connect to the existing two inch force main for the subdivision using the city of Los Center standards. The applicant will follow the city erosion control standards and, and DOE construction stormwater permit to prevent impacts to adjacent property owners. So the, app, the contractor, once they implement all this erosion control, you know, they're responsible for all of their impacts. So any impacts downstream, the contractor has to make that, make that right clean up. They will usually install erosion control, inlet control at the catch basins to prevent silt from getting into the storm system downstream. So there's a lot of things that they have to do. So that's a condition. And the applicant will need to design the stormwater outfall from the wet pond to prevent erosion to the downstream storm system. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. I had a couple, just to follow yes. up on a couple things you just said. Uh, then, who was it? Holly Park Subdivision Homeowners Association noted that there's 39 homes in Holly Park, but yes. you said there's 23 served by the gravity or force man. I assume the rest are gravity. Mm, that, that is true. The rest, the rest is served by gravity. Okay. Mr. Hearings Examiner, I have a couple items to add. That okay. Um, if if that's all right. That's um, fine. Yeah. We received a couple of um, comments yesterday, and so I'd like to go over that. If, uh, okay. Well, one yesterday and one today. And um, so one of them that we received um, yesterday, um, most of the stuff will be um, addressed in tonight's presentation. The comments that we received today um, regarding the trees along um, Ivy. I wanted to assure that the applicant has submitted a tree cut plan and that the applicant um, has proposed to mitigate 72 trees being removed and there'll be 29 trees planted with um, the project and 43 native trees planted in the open space tracks and rear yards. Um, and then, um, as noted, the road from Ivy to Second is proposed to be paved um, past, is it Mr. Lucio's place at 908? Did I say that wrong? Lucio? Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, and um, It'll the, be paved to where? It will be paved, I believe, past, just right past um, 908 East second okay. way right okay and then um, we currently don't have a construction schedule at this time as was asked in the um, comment letter and 
um, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about on page 13 of the staff reports, it's noted that all developments within the UH-10 zoning district shall provide a or reserve a 20 foot wide natural vegetated buffer along the pro um, property lines. And the property um, to the south currently has a urban holding overlay. The proposed plat has a 35 foot tract to the south. It's tract H and um, that tract actually belongs to Clark County. The tract um, also provides access to the parcel to the south and the applicant is not proposing any development on this tract. It'll all be natural vegetation there. Um, and the um, homeowner to the south, south has also provided comments and per exhibit nine and the applicant um, would like to, per a conversation with the applicant, he would like to work with the homeowner there to the south um, regarding that um, 20 foot landscape buffer. Um, and then the lots located uh, to the west of the property have a 20 foot plus steep slope setback and the property to the west is also owned by Clark County Legacy Lands and it's not developed or proposed to be developed. The slope, back, slope setback is greater than the 20 foot required landscape buffer and will provide a natural buffer between the sites. The slope setback is equal or greater than the 20 foot landscape buffer. I just wanted to note that um, for the uh, staff report. Okay. <clears throat> is that it? That is it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cooper, I still have one more follow up I wanted to ask you. You said that the applicant is going to gate Ivy and you said that a condition should be warranted, should be imposed that they um, do that before construction begins. Is there a condition to that effect? Do you want me to add one? Uh, there is. Well, the gate is permanent, but yeah. there needs to be something in place to prevent uh, construction vehicles or vehicles from traveling down that. But uh, there also needs to be some access to the private property owners because they need to access their property. So I guess. What I'm saying is there needs to be some kind of protection to prevent construction vehicles from going down there. So the applicant will, that'll, I, I think some kind of fence or gate already in place might might be warranted. So I can let the applicant respond to that too. Okay. Do you think a condition is warranted or do, uh, do you just think that something, the applicant needs to do something? They need to do something. So okay. I don't know if so it's no a condition, condition, but it should be noted that they, they need to do some kind of protection from access to that. Okay. What about the issue with that the neighbors raised? I saw this myself. Is the there's no mitigation plan? It appears your code requires it before um, before we yes. can get to preliminary approval because 18300090 2D3G requires a mitigation plan with critical area with the critical areas report and doesn't defer, allow deferral to final engineering. And you and you could comment to that. I figured. Mm -hmm. Yes. And 18300902I, Roman numeral I, requires city approval of mitigation plan as, re, as a prerequisite for approval of development activity. So it seems like it's a requirement before we get to preliminary approval. Exactly. I agree with that. Okay. And um, the applicant has submitted that mitigation plan. It was an okay. exhibit um, that I sent to you. Um, it was either it, it was either yesterday or this morning. I may have missed that email. I'll have to check and see if I don't find it. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. I believe it's exhibit 22, but I would have to go. Okay. Um, I have a number of questions or comments about the uh, staff report. So bear with me. Just want to clarify some things sure. before we get um, on page 20 of the staff report. I'm not sure. It's at the very top says the impacts have been mitigated to the greatest extent possible. Okay, this is the variance. Sorry, I forgot which one we're talking about here. What impacts are there from the variance that need to be mitigated? Um, that was just 
So meeting the one through six that they met all of the applicable approval criteria. So I was just. So you're not saying there are impacts. Exactly. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. The under number six, you're finding branding the variance won't be materially detrimental to the public welfare, et cetera. It's just a conclusory statement. There's no, why won't it be? Right. Right. It, it, well, yeah, it's just a statement. There is, I mean, granting the variance is not going to be detrimental to the public welfare. It's two feet in the um, width of the lot. And so I. It's two feet what? It's just a two foot where, uh, variance in the width of the lots. Okay. And and that won't be detectable without a measurement. You won't notice that it's narrower. No. Okay. No. I, I just need needed. There needs to be a finding that's beyond what the code requires is all. Okay. And I, I, that's what I needed. Okay. Um. Amen. Again, on page 20 under critical areas review. Okay, I, I just answered my own question. Never mind. So I thought that one. Um, the GIS packet under environmental constraints map shows that um, there's non-riparian habitat on this site and pretty much everything on that map. But it's not, I didn't see that addressed in the critical area of review. So there's riparian habitat and that's clearly addressed associated with stream, but not, not non-riparian habitat. And the applicant may have some thoughts on that since it's their critical areas report, but I wanted to give the this city an opportunity to respond. And so, I don't know, maybe I need to get into this a little bit more, but on page 22, it's talking about the riparian buffers for lots. Yeah, this is non-riparian. Oh, okay. Yeah, the riparian, I think, is addressed. And it's so, um, and WSP prepared the, um, the consultant prepared the critical areas comments and so I can go back to them and see exactly what they have to say. I'm obviously not a biologist. Right. Okay. I'll see I... what the applicant has to say too. But <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to raise that issue. Yeah. Can we pull up the, the preliminary plat again? Sure. Because it appears to me that a portion of the extension of second way extends into the 200 foot riparian buffer and it's not mentioned um, and it but it appears to be allowed based under the code because it's a street streets are allowed in the buffer mm -hmm. but I just didn't see it mentioned that there have to be no other reason I have to find that there's no other reasonable alternatives based on top topographic and environmental conditions as determined by the director um, I'm assuming it's because of where Second Avenue is right now. They have to get it into the site. They have to turn it south. But I didn't see any findings of that effect. Yeah, there's there's no other way to get access from East in going through East Second. Okay. So they're trying to curve it down as far as they can, I think. But but they'll have to comment on the impacts. Page 23 of your staff report. Re uh, under other critical area requirements says that uh, the applicant has to stake flag and fence or otherwise identify the, air, the riparian area buffer prior to site improvements. Because that extends, what is the riparian area buffer modified by this intrusion, this Second Street, because otherwise those markings, if they're on the edge of the buffer, have to go in the road. Can they, is there a, a, an option to move them to the edge of the roadway or back the sidewalk, I guess? I will let the applicant address okay. that.
Yeah, that's also a condition. I don't know which one, but that same issues. Um, back on page 21 of the staff report, it talks about the seismic hazard that there are Class D soils. Are those, and that is a seismic hazard, is that addressed through the building permit? Because it, um, It, it requires the, the design recommendations from the geotech report. Sorry. The geotech report confirmed that Class D soil should be used with design recommendations unless deeper explorations or geophysical studies are completed. Is Are those design recommendations, which aren't specified, addressed in the built, through the building permit process or are they in the geotech report? I'm going to see if we can leave that one to the applicant. That's fine. I, I want to give staff the opportunity if you want yes. to leave it to the applicant. That's um, I don't know. Tony, did you want to answer that? Or would you I, like to... I mean, I think this is typical uh, information that's, that's in the geotechnical report. Okay. So uh, under the billing permit, they, they have recommendations in that report on, on the kind of foundation that would be used. So they would recommend that this this is just general information about the class. Okay. Uh, so I, I think it's just it's just general information that they provided. But it, the applicant can confirm that. It looked like it was a finding. That's why I wanted to ask. On page twenty four under priority habitat, Oregon white oak. Um, the code requires a buffer based on consultation with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and accordance with best available science and was DFW uh, consulted and that they agree? They were sent the SEPA determination and um, they did not comment okay. on it. I assume they agree then. On page 24, it also talks about mitigation for um, the oak trees, but it does, looks like there aren't the oak tree singular. There are no impacts. So there's a condition of approval. The applicant shall provide a revised critical area report to include a mitigation plan. It seems like that is unnecessary if there are no impacts. I agree with that. Okay. On page 29, regarding tree preservation or mitigation for removal. Again, I think I just, there are, they're removing 72 trees and they're planting 43 native trees and 29 street trees. So that adds up to 72. So it's a one to one mitigation. Yeah. Okay. Right. First time I read that, I missed the. <laughs> Okay. It's the Ivy Avenue offsite to the north. Is that available for pedestrian access? It was a lot of there was some mention that students walk there. I assume students would walk it, there from here. It is. It is. Is there an easement or other? There is no easement. It is school property. Okay. Uh, the the access should go through Holly Park, but I think it's a shortcut. So right, it, for pedestrians no anyway. Access easement. It's it's like I say, part of it is is already on school property, but yeah, that's what, I, that's sorry, why I they can't walk, take any but, testimony. But if you want to but, tell me during your testimony, I'm sorry, but, but Mr. yes, that, that is correct. It, it it stops right on Ivy 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 uh, Avenue, but uh, but really the the um, there's also another access point through Holly Park to get to the school. Just, there is a, I'm sorry, there, there is, is there is another access okay. point to is get. That, it, it's it's not it's it's kind of circuitous, so yeah. it's that's why they take. And is IV improved enough to accommodate emergency vehicles? Because I think that was um, to, um, the, the, the fire district appears to require good question. access. That's good question. It it is really not designed for it. Um, 
I don't know about emergency vehicles. That that might be something we could discuss, but it's not really designed for any other vehicles other than just access to property. Okay. Um, and and I don't know. I mean, it's been around for a long time. It's just a very uh, it's a very substandard road. It's really just more of a more of a just an access road is all. It's it is. my recollection that the fire district required a second access, which I assume is Ivy, but I also understand they can waive that if they applicant provide sprinklers or other mitigation that the fire department. Yes, that's that's the fire department call. So that's the fire district's yeah. call. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. The um, the driveway that goes to the neighbor to the south. The neighbor asked about who's owns that. Obviously, it's going to be public right of way where it's paved. But the uh, portions goes across fourteen lots, fourteen and fifteen, which would be private lots. They actually the the access is south of the lots. The the lots for um, Breezy Creek have been um, shown to be north of that access road, as I or as I recall. I I think that's what it shows there is that the access road is south of those lots. How do the neighbors get from the on-site road to their to that access? That's There's south? an access road. Well. If, it looks like it, the road goes across yes. the eastern edge of lots 14 it, and 15. It, 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 it does, but it's along the eastern edge and then this. Right. And then they, I think I think it continues, the applicant can confirm this, but I think it continues along what's called track. I can't, in that little yeah. triangular track. There's See, an access I think, road but yes, I, I, and That I understand. It's just where yeah. it, it goes across 14 and 15. Well, that, that yeah. strip where the, the access to 14 and 15 and the property to the south be owned by a home, homeowners association or the owners of lots 14 and 15 because the owner to the property to the south wanted to know who's owning the property where his easement's located. And that yeah, that. I, I think um, I can't see it from here, but but there will be an easement in there. That's my yeah, understanding. I think the easement exists. They can't get rid of it. I yeah. But again, yes. this may be for the applicant. It's not a critical it's, issue. There is an easement and it, this can't change it. They, yes, they, the easement has to stay where it is. They still have to have access there. Page 13 of this staff report, I think, just has a typo or carryover from a prior decision, or, or rather, um, staff report. Like that's what my notes is, but I don't see where I let's skip that one for now because I can't find it. Yeah. Has the uh, will this approval lift the urban holding 10 overlay? Yes. Okay. That was my understanding. Um, and I'll just final few on the conditions. Condition 14 appears to repeat condition seven with the planning conditions. Um, both require revised critical areas to include mitigation. Um, one just cites to the code and has a few more words in it. <laughs> okay, you can strike one of those. Okay, we'll delete 14 because it's the other one has more Okay. Specific specificity. Mm -hmm. uh, condition 11, the applicant shall permanently mark the outer extent of the buffer. I assume that's riparian buffer. I'm just double checking. Sure. Around. Yeah. Where? Um, you know, I, w I would like to verify that one if that's okay. okay. I would assume the same, but um, yeah, I would just like to yeah. confirm it. Um, which one was that? Condition 11. 
Yeah, if it, the, it does cite to the code. I'm assuming that's the Viparian code. I just don't have it in front of me. Um, yeah, that's what I'm Condition 17 is a repeat of condition 21. They both require revised geotechnical report. So I think assume we want to address a uh, delete one. Sure. Condition 28, I'm just not sure what it's saying. It says the applicant shall provide a reserve or 20 foot wide natural vegetated buffer along all property lines prior to final occupancy. And that was um, that was per the urban holding overlay that I had noted right. earlier. And so all the properties abutting the project site with urban holding require a um, 20 foot um, 20 foot wide natural vegetated buffer along the property lines mm -hmm. prior to final occupancy. And then, um, but I would like to make corrections to that based on the information that I gave to you this evening regarding the um, tract H and then the steep slopes along the Western. Right, line. okay. Um, I'm gonna have to hold the record open for that purpose and I'm happy to do so. Um, is it weak enough? Um, yeah, is, is the applicant's okay with that. Okay. Um, and if you, well, during that, if you can revise a condition 28 to, I'm still not, it talks about that. I know what you're talking about, but I'm not sure what it's intending to say there. Right. Just the way it's phrased. Okay. Condition 45 talks about a pedestrian path, and I didn't see one on this plan. Prior to final engineering approval, the pedestrian path is shown on the flat shall be five, revised to five feet wide. Oh, that's, that's, uh, okay. okay. I thought it might be, but I wasn't sure. And then one last one, condition five under the public works engineering condition. Uh, it lists, let me, let me get there just a second. It says the applicant shall follow all recommendations in the report by, prepared by True North. Um, we'll need to comply with the following for the report. Then number six is over excavation. I thought there were a lot more than just that one. Uh, delete what? Number eight, because that would—that's the only. Spe uh, oh, six, sorry. <laughs> I've written over the top of it. Um, so five, five says follow all recommendations in the report, which seems appropriate. Six specifies a, a, a specific condition in, from the report. It seems if we delete that, all the conditions in the report will apply based on five. I'm, I'm sorry? Delete six. Okay, yes, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. They need to comply with the uh, geotechnical report. Right. To begin with. Well, that's the extent of my questions. The applicant's opportunity to testify. Good evening. Scott Taylor, uh, SGA Engineering, uh, representing the applicant, and I'm um, here to answer any questions as well this evening and um, discuss the project with you guys. So I'd like to start off with thanking staff for their time with the review and third party uh, reviews, and then Mr. Hearings Examiner as well uh, for your time this evening. <clears throat> I think the presentation has covered majority of the neighbor's questions and um, inquiries on the project. Uh, and I believe majority of your questions had been answered, Mr. Turner, but I know there are a couple that I can definitely uh, talk to. Uh, first question um, that was um, unanswered as of yet uh, for construction schedule um, from one of the neighbors. Uh, the construction schedule uh, exactly is not known at this time. Typically, 
a projects like to start construction in the summertime. And that would be the goal of this project is to start construction in 2025 in the summertime. The length of construction time can vary for a number of different pieces. Contractors and developers want to be done as quick as they can because um, it costs money the longer you have equipment on site. So typically they're going to try and get all their heavy construction done as quick as possible, whether that's four months or five or six months. Um, sometimes construction things can take longer um, for details and working with utility companies and some of the, the, the minutia that goes on. But the heavy construction, they would like to be done as soon as they can, um, but exact timelines are not yet known. Um, home construction can take longer, is often done within one to two years, um, could go quicker, but also could take longer depending on the future builder of the homes and how they sell the lots and building custom homes or spec homes. And so typically you see at least a one year timeline for home construction. Um, as Tony mentioned, that there are lots of requirements for erosion control and tracking off site, you know, not tracking up mud and dust into adjacent subdivisions that would run into their storm systems and plug up their storm system. So if there is off site tracking that can be enforced by city uh, inspection uh, for during construction uh, for the erosion control and also the state. The state has very stringent time um, restrictions on any uh, tracking off site and mud that would impact adjacent developments. And so they have pretty steep fines and, as well that come along with those. So contractors will be working very hard to not track and not have erosion that affects adjacent developments or downstream areas. <clears throat> There is non riparian habitat area mapped in the GIS packet, mm -hmm. um, but this was not identified by our biologists in their report. And so this is a mapping that covers pretty much the whole town. That's and so like. sometimes GIS has had these as inaccurate mappings that we've seen. Um, oftentimes you'll have large areas that are mapped that cover you know, miles and it might be mapped for like a brown bat habitat or um, oh, what's the other one? There is a couple different species that have large sandhill cranes. Much of is sandhill crane habitat, and even over existing development and buildings and whatnot. And so that wasn't identified in our staff in our um, critical areas report as um, priority habitat that needs any form of protection or mitigation. The uh, applicable Critical areas have been discussed at length. You have riparian habitat that's adjacent to the streams. You have the oak tree that's existing on the very south edge of the site that will remain untouched. And then the wetland on site that is proposed for uh, um, fill and development. And so the um, mitigation plan was submitted, um, just recently completed. And so that can be reviewed and discussed in this one week of open record. Um, it meets all city standards. Um, they are proposing mitigation in the tracks A through F, and like staff mentioned, tracks A through F will be combined into one for stormwater and open space. Uh, the mitigation plan proposes uh, 320 plants to be planted, 75 of which will be trees. So new uh, fir trees and uh, white oaks are proposed to be planted in that area to mitigate for the impacts of a stormwater facility. There's also hundreds of shrubs that will be uh, native shrubs that will be planted in that open space tract to offset impacts. <coughs> Stormwater facility and roads are allowed to be located in the 200 foot riparian buffer if there's no alternatives um, that are feasible for the project. That's been discussed in the mitigation plan and also in the findings. And as you can see from the site, it is constrained on three of the four sides and the fourth side having existing development to the east. So it's pretty much constrained on four sides. <clears throat> For that purpose, the storm facility uh, needs to go in this location. It's existing field and not forested habitat. And so it's allowed as a use without significant impacts. We're not removing mature trees to build the storm facility, um, a forest of trees. There's a handful of trees that were planted by the current property owner around the year 2000. And that's where all the trees on this site have come from. 
And so um, the fact that some of those are being removed is unfortunate, but a piece of development that's necessary. The road must connect where it's currently stubbed to the site for second, and it must extend into the site, provide access to all the lots. It's a public road. Um, you're not allowed to use private roads um, that serve more than five lots in this um, jurisdiction. And it's built to public standards, and so it will provide emergency access turnaround, uh, delivery turnaround, and public access. Um, new sidewalks will be connected to existing sidewalks um, and provide access for people to walk. IB Avenue is an existing driveway that a um, easement was placed over many years ago. Um, Mr. Breezy, I think, originally dedicated the land to the school, and at that time, an easement was placed over the driveway to the existing home to the south. So you guys are correct. The current property owner owns the land underneath that easement, and the school owns the land underneath the easement to the north. In the future, lots 14 and 15 could own that easement area where they'll use it for their shared driveway. One other option um, is a tract could be platted there. And so where the easement line is, we could place a new lot line. that wouldn't affect lots 14 or 15. It would place that shared driveway in a tract, which could still be owned by the property owners or the HOA. There's not a set requirement really for who has to own it. Um, it is common that you have existing easements that continue on after development, as similar to this case. Um, the road would be paved, as shown in the plans, with asphalt um, for the public road. The driveways would likely be concrete. And so those would be paved all the way to the south edge of lot 15. And that actually goes back past all of the lots um, in Holly Park and about to the last lot. There's three lots back there. Um, that sit east-west. And so that will definitely help cut down on dust, you know, and deliveries and traffic that go to the existing house to the south. Um, speed limit was a question on one of the neighbor's comments. And, you know, typically subdivisions and all these local access roads are 25 mile an hour speed limits. So that would be posted in the development and enforced by the city. Um, shared driveways don't necessarily have a posted speed limit. But if you're coming off of a 25 mile an hour road, it's going to hold that same speed limit, I, I would assume. Again, these are um, enforcement issues that come down to city policing. And so if neighborhoods have concerns, you know, with speeding traffic, then they have to reach out to law enforcement and or city council and ask for help, you know, to try and deal with people speeding or deliveries or construction vehicles, um, anything of that nature. Um, as Mr. Cooper mentioned, the road's built to public standards. Um, you know, I think our geotech's recommending four inches of pavement over 11 inches of um, crushed base rock. So it's a pretty significant road section. All of the local roads are designed that way to handle construction traffic, uh, deliveries, large trucks. But as mentioned, if there is uh, damage done during construction, it's a responsibility of a contractor that caused the damage to repair things. The streets themselves should be able to handle the vehicle traffic. There was concern about students walking to school in the morning, and in theory, those students should be on these trails or in the sidewalks, but they do cross roads. You know, all public traffic, contractors, neighbors, everyone needs to watch out for students and pedestrians. And so that um, construction time, you know, is allowed by the city with their code. And so the contractors would not be able to work any earlier or later than is allowed by city noise ordinances. Um, they typically, once the site has had all the construction equipment on the site, they're not leaving and coming every day with large equipment. Um, so it's limited traffic after initial um, construction has begun. But we understand there are concerns for that, and we agree that you know people need to abide by the rules of the, the road and safety as far as the neighbors and pedestrians. I don't think there's any additional conditions um, necessary um, in the report, but just wanted to make sure and discuss these items because I know they're concerns with the neighbors. Um, staking of the buffer, you know, at the edge of the modified buffer um, is where that would take place. So for instance, where 2nd Avenue is going to come in, um, 
you wouldn't stake in the middle of the street, you'd be at the back of the sidewalk. And that's what I assumed, they just wanted it. Staking there. There would be construction, um, silt fence that would go along the north side of the site and along like the uh, slope setback. So this plan shows a 15 foot slope setback. City staff has, uh, per their code, required a 25 foot slope setback. So that'll be increased by 10 feet. At the edge of that slope setback is where a silt fence would go and protect the slope and any construction uh, equipment and stuff to not go um, in the slope setback. Silt fence would go around the perimeter of the whole project, um, which is typical for construction. This fencing for the habitat buffer would go along the back of lots one through six. So that is the buffer line. Um, in the future, you would have signage on fence, um, every lot that would say habitat buffer retain a natural state. That's a condition already. Um, there would be likely fences built, but not necessarily required. Common uh, fencing, you'll have six foot tall uh, cedar fence or wood fence. They could also do like a split rail fence at the back of these lots so they could see past into the open space and stormwater tracts. Um, but that sort of discusses the buffer being fenced off and how it will work with construction. Emergency vehicles currently would use Ivy Avenue to access the home to the south. So first responders, police, sheriffs, um, ambulance, they would all come back there and access that. The fire department um, was there at our pre-op conference and we talked with them and they have comments they provided. You know, they would not like to ever use Ivy for their fire trucks. And I understand that, that concern. It is a very old road that's been in uh, existence a long time, has a small culvert, and it has steep slopes on both sides and critical areas. For all those reasons, along with the school ownership, um, you know, we're not able to improve Ivy Road and widen it to be a public road mm -hmm. and meet public standards. So uh, fire would need to come in through um, Holly Park subdivision and access these homes. Emergency vehicles, though, would be able to come across Ivy and access through the gate. So there'll be a Knox box that allows fire department and emergency vehicles to open and get access to the gate code and come in in the event of emergency. Also in the event of emergency, if the roads are blocked out of Holly Park subdivision, you know this could be opened and people could utilize Ivy Avenue to exit this area. Um, that's our concept with the gate. Staff supports that gate idea for um, limiting access. We definitely don't want any construction vehicles ever using Ivy and um, no future residents of this development would be able to utilize Ivy either. So it could remain though as being used by pedestrians as it is today. All the students conveniently walk across that and through up to the school. And there's a trail also behind the homes in, Ivy, in uh, Holly Park that students and uh, the public use as well. And that connects to Ivy Avenue just off, off the screen to the north. So we're in favor of retaining those uses. I don't know if any additional easement language ever needs to be added for the public pedestrians to use it. It is owned by the school and there's school students mostly using it. So I think there's, there's already a symbiotic relationship going there. Uh, I don't think there are any conditions that need to be added to that effect. Would a portion of Ivy be on this site that the students would use? Um, yes, there, if they come from the existing sidewalk, so right at the very northeast corner of the mm -hmm. site, they could come off of the sidewalk and go through um, an opening in the gate or a side area that would be allowed for pedestrians. So that'd be part of this gate uh, design is open access for pedestrians. So the applicant does plan to provide for that physically by uh, yes. not completely gating it off. Yeah, you would have, you know, a side, you know, trail connection yeah. or a sidewalk connection. Probably you just need a gap edge. in the gate, next between the gate and any anything else that might yeah. preclude. Okay. So the gate would be solely for vehicle restraint. Yeah. I think you guys have covered all of the conditions of approval that had some overlap or had maybe carryovers. Um, I only have a couple comments. So i believe condition of approval 11 
is talking about riparian buffer. Um, staff can confirm that, you know, okay. with the open record. Yep. But that is the only buffer right now. Um, slope setbacks aren't really a buffer, and the wetland is being filled, so there's no wetland buffers. And so that should be riparian. And we'd like to definitely review, you know, condition 28 when that is um, updated and how it applies. <laughs> Uh, public works conditions number four, it's on page 41. That has a second sentence. Um, it talks about the new houses in Holly Park subdivision. I think that should just say this subdivision or Breeze Creek trails. It's a forest main in Holly Park. Uh, subdivision, but it'll serve this subdivision. So mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. And then on page 44, it's condition of approval six um, under the SEPA mitigation conditions. That one refers to Lancaster Mobley as the traffic engineer. And it was Kelly Engineering, uh, January of 2024. I'm sorry, what was, who was the traffic engineer? Uh, Kelly, Kelly Engineering. Okay. okay. And only last comment, um, just to go on record. Um, Fire sprinklers uh, will likely be used because of the access challenges, you okay. know, with one access point right. for these homes. I believe there's about 55 existing homes that utilize second and come through Holly Park um, currently. This would add 15 more homes, so we'd be up to 70 homes on one access point. You know, other jurisdictions allow up to 100 homes off a single access point. Fire code is the newer code that's come out with the 30 lots and above needs a second access point. Um, emergency wise, we have that partially covered, but it's just not feasible to have a second public access road. And so for that reason, sprinkling of the future homes is one form of mitigation that the fire department likes, because um, then they know that they've got that helping them out in the event of a fire. Okay. <clears throat> uh, that's all I have currently and definitely available to answer questions after testimony and then your questions. Okay, thank you. I don't have any questions at this point. All right, thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to testify in support of the application? Seeing none, who'd like to go first in opposition or with questions or concerns? Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Gerald T. Minahan. I I'm sorry, can you say that? Gerald T. Minahan. And how do you spell your last name? M-I-N-I-H-A-N. -I -I Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Okay. As, well, I married into the family, but as the family that created Ivy Avenue, at least past when the wheelhouse was, whenever that was, past that point, and if you go by overlap, if you take the old farm that the current uh, housing development is built on, I would say, we created the road clear up to at least Second Avenue. I still have access. At least you own the property it. to the south. Is that correct? Of this no, site? I'm oh. the I'm at I'm at Fourth, but I own okay. the farm that the uh, Holly subdivision was built on. Okay, and the property behind it. Okay, and going by. Said we built the road up to a certain point. Mm -hmm. Once the residents that uh, Seth and Stephanie are current in is down the road and around the curve, which was that part of the road was done by gentlemen's agreement, and they're 
technically was no easement there. Now you go back to where he's saying the school owns, the school has an easement onto Ivy and so does the city. And the city owns a certain, or not the city, but the school owns up to a certain point to the edge of this new development minus what used to be an old railroad uh, easement, which is kind of like right there at the gulch that divides the school from this property we're okay. talking about. Yeah. So anyway, my question is, what gives them the right to build over the private road? Because we still have access to our property in conjunction with the uh, a homeowners association on the remaining acreage we have behind uh, Holly subdivision. Okay. South of? So, yeah. Okay. Well, west, south, yeah. And anyway. I, Holly's east of this property. Holly subdivision east of this. So I'm just trying to picture where you, where the property you're referring to is. Okay, my is property it accessed via your property that you're talking about. Is that access via Ivy Avenue and this this easement that part is? Yeah, if you go to the end of Ivy, uh huh, before the curb goes off to right. their home, right, there's a gate there. That allows me to access your property, the remaining property from the farm. Okay. That right. was, now I understand. I was just trying to picture all this in okay. my head. Now That's, I know what you're talking about. And now, as far as I know, the city has easement on Ivy. Uh huh. And so does the school. Uh huh. But that is north, well, on the fourth street side of this small culvert we're talking about. The access that went past the culvert was by gentleman's agreement. So you're saying there is no easement on this site for the existing driveway, is that correct? Is that pretty much okay. other than gentleman's agreement, right? Which we just carried and forward. After so many years, it's likely a prescriptive easement. Uh, it's like grandfathered in, not, no, sorry, wrong, wrong. Probably word. close to it, it's, being it, Adverse possession is actually what at it is. At least it allows them Because to you've their used house. it for so long, you yeah, created an easement. Here. I'm assuming the applicant would be willing to create an easement over the two legalize that just to make it but they should not have the right to build across ivy avenue which they have the right from to do second to if, ivy. Go, i'm sorry I, i'm not that, I'm cry, when there's when you're saying you go, ivy avenue talking about off-site to the north or or your you access to the culvert, driveway culvert uh-huh yeah we created it probably if we could get an overlap we probably created it up to where that big where the road is and where the big, because we had a barn okay. that ran right along there and it had a driveway that kind of went around the green barn. If you take the overhead map, you know, we created all that or the family did. Mm -hmm. And we're talking some time ago. Yeah. Yeah. I some time ago. And so, you know, so when you're, I'm just not, I'm trying to understand what you're, where they're building a road over Ivy Avenue, that this road on this site, on the east boundary of this site, is that I what you're- I thought it was coming right across. And you said something about putting a gate up to prevent people from going. Okay, yeah, that, that would be, that gate's gonna be somewhere north of this, where Second Avenue comes in, where that road is right on the east, that north-south section of road on the east boundary of this site. Yeah, well- My, That gate's gonna be just to the north of that. It's to prevent anybody else, but you, who has, you and the neighbors to the south that have right to access that yeah. area so these the residents of this site don't have that right but as far as i know they were talking about school ownership uh, yeah i don't have any the only jurisdiction i have is over this development okay. and who owns it isn't something or who owns that property i don't get to decide yeah um so okay I, but anyway so i just want to make sure i've I, heard from some just yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to pull up Google Maps on my phone if that's if anybody has any objection to that, just so I can see. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. So everybody can see it. Mine did. I'm not sure I can get to. If I can interrupt. Yes. talking about lots 14 and 15 are 
Right. I understand it goes below that. I, I just wanted to clarify that I'm understanding your concern. So let's go ahead and pull up. SAP's going to pull up Google Maps so we're all on literally the same page. I know where you're talking about, and I can visualize it. But is your concern that they're paving over your existing driveway access or the, or the gate or bolts, yeah. that they're putting a gate over your existing driveway? Well, that, they're doing that and they're proposing that. You know, the foot traffic's not such a big deal. But when they go into talking about the city enforcing, okay. The city enforcing what? Uh, speed limits? Uh, parking, speed limits, things like that. They've pretty much been borderline on that for quite a long time. They're, it, it's almost to the point of abusive e easement. And I was going to, at one point, actually go for it and, and go to a judge about it. Okay, um, because if, if you're arguing about the, you, that your right to use that property, um, how you then that's something you do need to go to a judge about. Um, my the applicant owns this parcel, yeah, and you have an, it as you know at some and prescriptive however right whether you have the right an easement right to access across it, yeah, um, but they can do whatever they want with it as long as it doesn't preclude your access. That so that's what the balance of rights are there. They can put. They can pave that if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, that's their right. You still have access. It doesn't preclude your access. Right. So if anything beyond that is something you'd have to talk to a judge about. Okay. Um, anything off-site, you'd have to talk to a judge about. Yeah. Okay. So well. here's the aerial photo. You can see it up here. Um, so there's the house down to the left. That's the neighbors. Your property is directly south of Holly Park, but it accesses because I don't see a driveway or any roadway extending south from there. I just want to make sure I'm clear about where, still clear about what you're talking about, yeah, where your property is. There's just a gate there. Okay. No okay. Thank you. you Coming straight along the east boundary, there's that driveway, and then it veers. You you continue south to get to your property, right? Okay. That's what I wanted to make sure I understood. <laughs> sure. This one. Oh. There we go. That's your property, sir. Thank you. It's kind of defined by what's left of the chain link fence that uh, I see at the end of uh, Minihan Road. Okay, thank you. All right, my name is Stephanie Klein. C L I N E. Uh, K L E I N. My husband, Seth, and I. Yeah, I are saw the, your, your. The sole homeowners. Written testimony. So, this project affects us the most. Mm -hmm. um, and so, we have um, some concerns about Ivy, and some of the concerns have been somewhat addressed by the applicant, but I think what looks good on paper doesn't always look good in practice and so because we're obviously intimately aware of what actually transpires from day to day i just wanted to add some additional commentary on that so as was mentioned northeast ivy can never be developed um we have the easement we actually do have a legal easement it has that's, been recorded that was okay. has been recorded as part right. of our um, purchasing the home from Peter Schlentz when we purchased when he split the property and we purchased the 10 acres along with the home back in 2018 we have a legal covenant and a legal easement for the road that okay. actually follows the house not us so it will always sure. be there and um, the concern that we have is that Ivy was meant to and built to be just a single lane road so we have had a lot of issues when the Holly Park subdivision uh, was being built as well as when it was I mean, we still struggle with this today. We have cars that come down Ivy and they, they have no place to turn around other than to, um, at the time, uh, they've been recently uh, mowing down that area of the field. But if, before it was mowed down, there was no place for people to turn around until they came all the way down. Now we're talking about putting a gate in. And if you know Ivy, if you spent time on Ivy, the portion of Ivy that if you could go up further up so I can to north uh, yeah to the north mm -hmm. we can see Ivy here 
So the portion of ivy that is in the trees there mm -hmm. is extremely narrow and goes over the culvert. Yeah, I saw those so photos. So you cannot go in reverse on it. So if you put a gate there, you will be in trouble. You won't have ability for people to be able to safely go in reverse without going over a ravine. And when you say there at the north property of this yeah, the boundary so like, of this let's site, say we've got this Amazon beyond this... drivers, UPS drivers, people who are trying to figure out where to get into the subdivision at. Um, we have people almost daily that still try to come down Ivy. So if you put a gate there, which will assist us in being able to use our easement, you will have daily traffic that is going to reach the gate and try to go in reverse over the culvert. If you try to put the gate in a different location, you will no longer be, you will now be in school district property rather than uh, the private property, the easements that, you know, follow south of that. So where you put a gate there, if should we put a gate, is very important. My husband and I are also really concerned because when Holly Park subdivision went in, they used the maximum amount of space of IB possible to put up their wall. And so it's not just fencing, it's also walls too. And we have to go a little bit over into uh, where the trees currently are to be able to safely navigate um, when we have larger equipment. We do have to have the ability to have, a, on occasion, uh, farm and tractor equipment, um, semis going down that road every once in a while because we do have livestock. And we have to be able to have emergency services, of course. So my other concern um, when we're looking back at that plot, that arrangement of homes going in depending on where if we're going to allow those two homes the way it's currently designed Lots to 14 also, and 15. Uh, yeah access ivy now we have a shared road situation um and we are concerned that we are not going to have a wide enough road so when you were looking at the paved section when you had the document up before um if you could quickly i don't know if you, you want to do the, that yeah the plan when you're looking at those lots 13 and 14 it appears that in order to um, sustain ivy as being um at least in its current width you would have to utilize a portion of their driveways if you look on here where the squares are mm -hmm. in order for ivy to be wide enough you would have to be using portions of their driveway to be able to safely get across that area so I don't know if that's if the road the way it currently is has been properly measured and that they've taken into account for that. But that is a concern of ours because it looks like past the huge road, then when it drops down into that paved area, it looks like it narrows considerably there. And we're also concerned that lots 14 and 15, if they are to use Ivy, which I'm not sure how they're able to do that. Um, but if they are able to do that, um, we don't have any no no fencing whatsoever so when we bought the property from peter he had no fencing and we have not fenced. so we do have animals and livestock that would end up in the front yards of 14 and 15. either they can fence the front of their property which they're not going to want to do or we're going to have to put a second gate in and the second gate would have to go past lots 15 in order for our animals to not get out from our property well I, you, your animals on their, onto this property would be trespassed, so you have the duty to keep your animals confined. The yeah. applicant doesn't have to exclude them from their property. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, we will be responsible for paying the thousands of dollars for fencing to keep our animals out of their yards. Yeah, because you don't have the right to have them run on this property. Never have. Okay. Unless you have an easement or something I'm unaware of. But. Okay. So that's interesting. Okay. So we'll, we'll try to do that. I don't know if we'll have the money for that so i, I don't know and yeah if our animals will end up in there how do they not. how do you keep them out now um because there's there was nothing there so when you put a property there they're obviously going to be interested our our animals have kind of roamed in that area for quite some time so they do wander up and there we, and we understand nobody that, but cares. we have to be realistic about how this is going to go down yeah. so that is a concern of ours yeah. um that if we are allowing lots 14 and 15 to use our driveway we would essentially need another gate to go in there so that we can keep our animals off there and subsequently their animals and their you know mm -hmm. Uh, the, those homeowners have the the duty to keep their any dogs okay. and other pets. Yeah, that will be have. a huge expense for us. Yeah, that that doesn't seem fair. Okay, but um, it's, it's uh, so I just want as that property no, owners, it's your duty to keep your okay. your animals. Confined. And then, additionally to that, then we're also going to be responsible for providing vegetation for privacy purposes because it mm -hmm. looks like at least uh, properties nine and ten 
especially 10 will be able to look right into our front yard, right into our home. And it is stated in here that the, the, the home there can possibly be up to 32 feet tall, um, right in our front there. So um, I am also asking if that will be the developer's responsibility to provide 32 feet tall vegetation for us, or if that's another thing that we'll need to spend uh, thousands of dollars on. That's, I'm gonna to have to look at that. It's because you are, is the property of the south outside the city or uh, in the city, yes, but zoned for? Yeah, outside the city. Okay. Yeah. Generally, the code doesn't require landscaping where along the boundary between city properties and county properties. Generally, landscaping is only required where it's commercial or industrial next to residential. So I don't believe the applicant is required to. I have to look at the code to confirm that, but okay. it's my assumption that they're not required to put any landscaping. Okay, so then our, so for my questions about Ivy, when will we um, find out answers about that? Like where, how does the process work where we have some concerns, we haven't really gotten answers on our concerns, what is the next step then? Um, probably, probably my decision, you can also talk to the applicant to maybe some of these that may not be addressed by the, the code, you can work out an agreement with them. But as far as, my, I, I want to repeat what I understand your concern on, make sure I understand. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I first have a question. You said you have a written easement across mm -hmm. this property for uh, your driveway, is that correct? We have an easement to be able to utilize uh, IV for the life of the home, yes. Right. How wide is that easement? Is it specified in the easement document? Because that's the extent easement. of your rights. Mm -hmm. um, whether the existing, if the existing driveway is wider than the easement, you could make an argument that I can't decide if you have to go to court to get if the, you can't get an agreement with the applicant that you have a prescriptive easement that you've used it enough for a long enough time to it's it you've basically acquired the right to use that it's called uh, so I'm who, sorry blanking so, out so it's land, called adverse possession okay so for, for 14 and 15 who owns that section of ID the applicant does you have a right to use it, an easement over the top, mm -hmm. but they can also use that easement over the okay. top. So they they can do anything with their property okay. that doesn't interfere with your use of the property for the easement for access. But I think that's the issue is we're saying that it would interfere with us being able to get down our road safely, as well as others, if it's a single track and it's not wide enough. It doesn't look like they're but it, still providing the same amount of width as what we currently have. Yeah, and, and, and um, again, that's gonna, if it's your easement says, I'm going to make up some numbers. Okay. It says 30 feet. Mm -hmm. It's 30 feet. If your easement says it's 15 feet, it's 15 okay. feet. If so, that's what's legally required that the applicant can't change. If your existing driveway is 30 feet, but your easement's mm -hmm. 15 feet, and you've been using that 30 feet for, I think it's 10 years. Don't quote me on that. Mm -hmm. And it meets other stand requirements that the courts have laid out for adverse possession then you could convince a court that you have the right to that 30 to use that drive that 30 foot of driveway and which in which case the applicant couldn't change that either it's it's all it's a different form of acquiring an easement i mean i think the spirit of the easement is that we're able to access our property okay property spirit of the easement way. doesn't it's what the easement but says if i understand what you're saying correctly if this plan if we find out that according to this plan which you can't tell from this drawing how wide that officially is. The applicant, I'm sure, will tell us when they get up to wide enough for us to get down the road safely with larger equipment, including emergency vehicles, we have to go to a judge. It, emergency vehicles would ha I have to be able to get through there, I assume. Um, but yes. Okay. Uh, for for any, anything bigger than a, um, it's, it's probably, I'll ask the applicant how wide that's going to be um, and how, so. Okay, yeah, because we have some issue with 14 and 15 again, the road being blocked. It doesn't appear as if there's enough space for those driveways there to be have cars parked there and for the road to also be accessible to us. So this is all related to the fact that Ivy is single lane and can mm -hmm. potentially be dangerous because there's no spaces for people to be able to turn around. Right. Once you put the subdivision in there, you're going to have people going backwards down a culvert on the north end of Ivy. Yeah, right. I understand that concern. Okay, that, okay. Yeah. 
And we also, oh, the other concern was just on the safety for kids getting to school. So I do believe that the applicant did talk about um, potentially like next to the gate, there being um, a space there for pedestrians. Mm -hmm. That um, where the, the gate would currently be located at, the, according to this drawing, there would not be space for a pedestrian area. So I'm just letting people know that they would need to cut into tract A possibly or some other location but the only access point to get to the school is actually Ivy. So the um, trail that they created for the Holly Park subdivision is too far north. It would be too far north of the gate for the kids from the subdivision to be able to access that. So the point where you would put the gate is very narrow there on Ivy. So it's just something to consider that you would want to make sure that you're cutting into tract A to allow for right. Free I think that's something the applicant can address yeah. when they're designing that gate okay. and locating it. But I, I appreciate the heads okay. up. Yep, I think that's my concerns for okay. right now. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Courtney Deporto. I'm. Can you spell uh, your last name? Yes, D E P O R T O. I'm a neighbor of Holly Park subdivision. And okay. is Courtney with a C or a K? A C. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> um, just. Two things. It sounds like the record's going to be held open for another week. Uh, at least. At least. Okay. What I'm, what I'm likely to do is hold it open for probably three weeks. Okay. Uh, week for the city to revise their their staff report, address these issues. So, based. I, I, let me rephrase that. A week for everybody to submit new evidence. That city applicant, public, anything you want to, anyone wants to raise. A week for everybody to respond to whatever was submitted during the first week so you can respond to what the city and the applicant provide and that's vice versa and then the third week for the applicant alone to submit a final argument which they can waive if they choose but if the applicant has the burden of proof they get the last word but that's what i'm likely to do Perfect. and i will announce that at the end okay thank you i just want to request a copy of the if there was an update to the critical areas report and any mitigation plan that was provided i think there's sure. a couple referenced in the documents but yeah you can get that those. from city staff i have Okay. I understand it's been sent to me, but I haven't seen it yet either, so I can't tell you anything about okay. it. And then just a comment on the sewer items. So I heard 23 homes for Holly Park, I guess I'd like to Are on this uh, on the two force, inch, main. force main. Yeah, so the rest are gravity flow. Okay, just confirmation that that is actually 23 homes. I couldn't find that in any evidence of Mr. Holly Cooper? Park. Yes, it's in the Holly Park subdivision plans. Okay. And I can provide that. It can be provided upon uh, records request. Okay. Yes. And then the the sub sorry the sewer calculations form references 30 homes as i put in my letter so he said 23 15 is 38 so if you do the math on that i won't you're, you're saying that it. the calculations math's wrong. are math's so wrong thank you the math would <laughs> equal 28.933 and the capacity is 29.3 so that's why i want to confirm that the 23 is actually accurate yeah because that's very close to being at max capacity and that is uh, and I'm sorry what was that form called the sewer that was the sewer attachment it was like a one-page calculation June 24 2020 and I think that was on their website that's all I have uh, that's the force I understand what you're saying I just want to make sure I get my note correctly Good evening. Good evening. Paul Wemhainer, W-E-M-H-O-E-N-E-R, 204 East Minihan Court. Just a quick question. For those of us that submitted to the record. For written testimony? Yes. Yes. How do we know that you received it since we used the mail? I and did. Uh, you can, there's an exhibit list that the city has. So if you're listed on that, it would be received. If it's not on that list you can submit it again um i'm sorry i can send you a copy of the exhibit list if you would like thank you i just want to make sure that what we submitted was received and then my second question is how do you respond to the issues that are i'll address them in my decision okay thank yeah, you I, I i should get i will get everything so if the city's gotten it, they'll get it to me, and I will review it and, and respond. Anybody else want to say anything about the application tonight? Good. 
Anything further from the city in response to the issues raised? Uh, no, we'll, we'll confirm some of the questions that were asked tonight. Great, thank you. <laughs> Anything further from the applicant? Good evening, Scott Taylor. Um, okay, um, based on the survey that we received from Minister Glazer's survey and the research they did, um, you can see two notes on this plan uh, on the screen. On lot 14, there's a note, and then on north of the site, north of track day, there's a note. And this talks about a recorded auditor file and the access easement that is in place. A 20 foot wide access easement over that existing driveway. And I appreciate the neighbor's comments about sort of the history of that and then also the current uses and what concerns they have with that. Um, if there's any concern or any issue that uh, comes up as far as access rights um, for uh, the Minahan family, then they could also be provided access to that gate um, that would be placed in that location if they have access rights through this easement to their remainder tract or their, their parcel to the southeast. So that's not a concern of the applicant um, or the engineers as far as access. Um, Ivy is shown in this plan, if you look at lot 15, at the south end of lot 15 where the driveway hatching that we provided ends, mm -hmm. that's matched up to the existing driveway exactly as surveyed. I don't know the exact measurement, it's probably 10 to 12 feet wide as a common sort of driveway width. 12 feet is a standard, you know, from uh, single driveways. Uh, a condition of approval has actually been placed on the project for these because they're flag lots, that a 20 foot all weather surface needs to be provided. So what's shown on the plans currently is 12 feet wide. That's actually gonna be 20 feet of pavement. Um, the access as it comes in off the sidewalk and off the main public road uh, could also be widened out some there to help with larger vehicles. I'm sorry. Where can it be widened out to? So um, where lots 14 and 15 will take driveway access off of second. Right, day, okay. And the driveway has a little curve in it. Yeah. That could be widened out Just to, to uh, accommodate that, tur that turn. Yep, okay. that could definitely be widened out. It will have to be 20 feet wide as it goes past lots 14 and 15. So it will basically pave the full easement. And, and it'd be 20 the, feet at the intersection as well, won't it? Correct. Okay, just wanted to make sure. So that should definitely help um, with circulation or use of that for the neighbors. Um, anything south of lot 15 is not proposed to be touched as far as driveway width or surface material um, or easement. That would all remain. Let me, let me finish up my note real yeah. quick. Thank you, go ahead. Yeah. Um, turnaround concern north of the gate on Ivy. Um, you know, there are signs, I believe, further north that say, you know, restricted access, no trespassing. Um, I'm not positive what exists as far as signage, but typically when you do have a dead end, you're gonna end up having dead end signage and um, informative signage, you know, that <coughs> tells people it's limited access. There's an opportunity maybe there um, where you could have like a hammerhead turnaround, possibly. You might have to talk to the school about using some of their land right there where it's sort of on the uphill side before it drops down into the creek um, area. So there's, there's an opportunity there, I think, for a possible turnaround um, before that gate. Um, I understand the concern of having somebody pull down there and have to try and back out. Um, I have visited the site a couple times and it's definitely very narrow and has the, the slopes on both sides. So I think coordination with the school would help to potentially um, deal with a turnaround. And who would build there. the turnaround with the applicant? The applicant would, would build that turnaround okay. if the gate goes there and the gate's causing that um, challenge, that concern, um, then they would you know build that turnaround, a little hammerhead turnaround. You don't really want to promote anybody coming down there right. um, that's not has access rights to it. But you do have the public that do not listen to the rules and go down dead end roads. Um, and so that's one thought I wanted to put on record. The idea of the, the student, you know, um, 
walking around the gate that could be placed on the west side of the gate, the left side. Sure. And so there is space there um, in the same area I'm thinking of that you know could have a turnaround. It is very limited in that area, and we do want to limit impacts you know to the buffers, but you need to have it function safely. And I believe all the other questions have been answered. And then staff is double checking on the items that they need to check on. Uh, did you have any other questions this evening? No, unless you have any objection to the, the uh, open record. I've no, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and discuss the open record. But I think the, the three week total timeline makes sense right. and works uh, well for a number of pieces of, of the um, testimony, review of the mitigation plan that was submitted and um, revising the um, staff report and conditions. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'm going to close the hearing. I am going to hold the record open, as I said, for a total of three weeks. Um, what time does things have to be received by the city? Is it 5 o'clock, or do you have an earlier deadline? For five o'clock. Okay. So I'm going to hold it open and for a week until I, oops, what did I do? Uh, until Tuesday, October 29th at 5 p.m. for anybody to submit new testimony and evidence. So anybody can raise any new issues or respond to whatever was the issues raised tonight, expand on them, whatever, by the 29th. At anything that anybody wants to submit has to be physically received by the city by 5 p.m. on Tuesday the 29th. I'll hold it open for a second week until Tuesday, November 5th at 5 for anybody to respond to whatever was submitted during that first week. So um, the second week is limited to, issue, to responses to the first week as well as the repair, the revised critical areas study, because that came in very recently. I want to make sure everybody, it, it wasn't technically submitted during this first, that first week that we're going to have, but I want to give everybody a chance to respond to that as well, because I haven't been available for review. And then for a final week until November 12th for the applicant alone to submit a final written argument, the applicant can waive that or they can submit their final argument early if they want to, but the applicant gets the final word. And again, anything anybody wants to submit, just let me finish. It has to be received physically by the city by 5 p.m. on the relevant date. Yes, sir, you had a question? Can you give us actually a week after the city provides us the information? Because if the information isn't provided to us till the end of it, then we yeah. don't have any time. No, I understand. Um, the, the information's going to come out. The city has to get theirs in by the end, by the 29th as well of October. So you'll have a full week after that. We'll have a week to respond after we, so we have to assume the city's going to immediately give it to us. And what's the Mm-hmm. So anybody can come in on the, the I guess it'd be the 30th of October that morning and get copies of what anything that was submitted um, to the city, including the city's own submittals, as well as the applicant. Yes, ma'am. Um, the exhibits, uh, those were seemingly handled differently. So I just. Um, uh, what was handled differently? The exhibits. So we were given the report, but we weren't given the exhibits. We could see them in person somewhere. Um, but it seems like. So we don't typically send copies of the exhibits. The exhibit packet is separate. You can either come in to get them. or Yeah, you can come here. You can email me. My card is, I'm Angie Merrill, and my card's back there. And so you can go ahead and email me. I can send you whatever you would like and um, get them to you. Yeah, and that applies to anybody. You can, If you want electronic copies, if that's easier, you can uh, contact Ms. Merrill, and she can email them to you. Thank you. So that concludes our hearing. I will try and get my decision out within about two weeks after the close of the record. And I'll send my decision to the city. The city will send it to parties of record.